Now, ironically, this Beardy and this progressive era approach sets the stage for the next interpretive school, that uh, what we call Civil War revisionism, the revisionists. Revisionism is a term used in almost any period of history to talk about people who change interpretations. The revisionists. Southern writers in particular seized on one part of the Beardian approach, that is displacing slavery from the story, and used it as a more plausible way of attacking the North, so to speak, than defending slavery. It was a little out of date to start defending slavery, and states' rights was you know, declining in, in, in appeal as the power of the government grew in the first part of the 20th century. Um, so by the 1930s and 40s, we have the rise of this revisionism building on the Beardian approach, but also building very strongly on a general revulsion against war itself. World War I, just as the Spanish-American War had promoted a nationalist outlook among historians, World War I, a world catastrophe which led to tens of millions of deaths for no purpose, really, one would have to say, um, discredited war in general and discredited the idea of linking war with high noble rhetoric. Um, historians came to feel that explaining war in large abstract terms tended to dignify it. Actually, and the same was then put back to the Civil War, put back in the Civil War. In other words, the war was unnecessary, they said, in that what it achieved could have been achieved without war. You didn't need war to preserve the Union. You didn't need war to get rid of slavery. Um, well, why did war come then? Well, they said because the, the blame it lies with both politicians and more so with irresponsible agitators, particularly the abolitionists. They whipped up emotions. They whipped up a kind of sectional fervor. These extremists um, appealing to irrational hatreds and irrational fears and created a situation of inflamed passion where war, where the politicians could not control it anymore. Uh, there were no deep, real underlying causes. There was just this world of, of, of intense uh, passions created by particularly the abolitionists. Um, the emotionalization, you might say, of politics, far out of proportion to any real concrete existing problems, um, created a situation in which political leaders failed. The two catchphrases, if, if the second American Revolution is the phrase to remember the Beardian approach, to remember the revisionist approach, there are two phrases. One, the blundering generation, as I said, and the needless war. A blundering generation stumbled into a needless war. Um, now, this revisionist view built up kind of slowly in the 20s, 30s. Um, it actually began with a totally unknown historian today, Mary Scruggum, a woman who in 1921 published a little book called The Peaceable Americans. She tried to do, didn't have the, the tools at that time, a kind of public opinion survey of northern and southern opinion on the eve of the war, newspapers, letters, and she concluded most people wanted peace. Most northerners, most southerners did not want war. So that's one piece of the puzzle. More influential was an influential article published in the late 20s by the southern historian Charles Ramsdell called The Natural Limits of Slavery Expansion. As we will see starting next time, the, and I mentioned, the issue of politics is the westward expansion of slavery. Well, Ramsdell says slavery could not expand. Slavery was, had reached the, the, the end of its expansion. The soil, the climate of remaining territory was inhospitable to slavery. So the whole issue was artificial. It was a whole uproar over an issue that didn't even exist. And moreover, not expanding, slavery would eventually die out because it exhausted the soil, cotton production, etc. So in other words, you didn't need a war. Slavery had reached its, its, its limit of expansion and was heading toward extinction 
anyway. It's a totally self-contradictory argument, actually. Slavery is non-expansionary, but if it doesn't expand, it will die, which actually it seems illogical. He also didn't consider the possibility, uh, which more recent historians have emphasized, of southern expansion. What about Central America, Cuba, the Caribbean? Many slave owners had their eyes there. But all right, anyway, this is, so this is, you have the two building blocks there. You didn't need the war to get rid of slavery, and most people didn't want war. And in the 1930s, this flowers in this revisionism. In one form, it takes an extreme pro-Southern orientation. Uh, for example, the Southern historian Frank Owsley, um, he wrote an essay called, The Cause of the War Was Egocentric Sectionalism on the Part of the North. The North was sort of an imperial power, it could not accept difference. It wanted to remake the South in its own image. Uh, it was intolerant of others and constantly interfering in Southern affairs. Uh, as some of Owsley's critique went way over the top, particularly on the abolitionists. Now, this is the 30s. Remember the decade in which Stalin is in control in the Soviet Union and Hitler is in control in uh, Germany. Here's what uh, Owsley writes. As far as I've been able to ascertain, neither Dr. Goebbels, that is Hitler's propaganda chief, neither Dr. Goebbels nor Stalin's propaganda agents have as yet been able to plumb the depths of vulgarity and obscenity reached by Wendell Phillips, Charles Sumner, and other abolitionists. The abolitionists were more extreme than Goebbels and Stalin's propaganda agents. That's extreme. More substantially, Owsley produced some important books on the southern yeomanry, small farmers, in which he basically said, you know, the South wasn't really all that different from the North. Most white southerners were small farmers, just like in the North. What is the problem here? Now, Owsley was so pro-southern and anti-northern that it was easier for northerners to say, well, this guy's out of control. The more influential, maybe, as revisions were two northern writers, James G. Randall and Avery Craven. Craven was a Quaker and a pacifist. Quakers do not like war. And in 1942, Craven published a very influential book, The Coming of the Civil War, which was an anti-war book, basically. Now, it's published in the midst of World War II, but nonetheless, it's an anti-war book. It's a Quaker book. Um, in fact, um, the Organization of American Historians has a prize they give out each year uh, called the Avery Craven Prize for the best book on the Civil War era, but it does not, but books on military history are not eligible because Craven was so anti-military. Um, but anyway, what was his argument? The, the, his argument was that the North invented the South, so to speak, intellectually that there was no South, that the South was heterogeneous, there were small farmers, there were big planters, uh, so was the North, too, um, th that there was no giant division between the two sections. Uh, and uh, again, he picks up the other idea that the slavery issue was emotionalized, it became, uh, it became slavery became a symbol of all sorts of differences. Um, the question, this is Craven, the question of why sections went to war is one of emotions, cultivated hostilities. In other words, not real ones, they're built up by somebody. And ultimately of hatred. Bloodshed became necessary, that's in quotes, necessary, because men associated their rivals with disliked symbols and crowned their own interests with moral sanctions. You have all these things in here. See, the interests are actually what's at stake, but they're given moral language etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. James G. Randall, who wrote a multi-volume biography of Lincoln, pushed the same idea. It's difficult to achieve a full realization, he says, of how Lincoln's generation stumbled into a ghastly war. Stumbled, you see, the blundering, how it blundered during four years of indecisive slaughter, and how the triumph of the Union was spoiled by the manner in which the victory was used. Again, these are the key pieces of language, stumbling into the war, blundered four years, indecisive slaughter, that's what war is, we shouldn't be glorified. Moreover, in his book, he basically said Lincoln and Stephen A. Douglas 
were basically the same. They both agreed on everything. He turned Lincoln into a conservative and Douglas into a guy much more radical than he really was uh, in order to argue that uh, there, was no, you know, there, there was no real need for conflict between them.